We continue with the first chapter of Richard Rorty's Contingency, Irony and Solidarity. We left off around page 9, and that is where we are going to pick up the thread. Um, let me just say that between this video and the previous video, I bought a new and much more professional microphone, so I hope that the audio quality will be noticeably better. And if not, well, that was a lot of money not well spent. All right, so in the first half of uh, the chapter, Rotti has been talking about truth, and he has been telling us that we should say that truth is made rather than found, right? When we are, when we have vocabularies that are, you know, that we use to express truths, what we shouldn't think, what we shouldn't think is that those vocabularies somehow mirror the world or that they somehow mirror the inner nature of the self. And so the idea that Rorty has been opposing is the idea that the ways that we speak, that the very concepts and uh, theories that we, that we search out, that those are somehow already there in reality or already there in the structure of the self. And then the evolution of language is going to be an evolution of our language towards those structures, right? The point where we're going to end up is the point where our language accurately mirrors the pre-existing quasi-linguistic structure of either external or internal reality. That's the kind of picture that Rorty is trying to oppose. And so he's been talking about truth and I was going to tell us more about language because of course what he needs is an opposing story about how language works and how language evolves. If it is not a teleological story of languages becoming ever more adequate to some pre-existing structure, then what is the history of language? So we return to the theme which is the title of the chapter, of the contingency of language, right? Which would be the idea that the development of language is full of accidents, right? Could have been completely different. Doesn't have some kind of pre-given teleological goal towards which it inevitably or, or quasi-inevitably, if that makes any sense, um, pro progresses, right? No. The history of language is full of accidents, could have been completely different. Um, there's a historical and causal story to be told about it, to be sure, but there's no sort of philosophical story to be told about it in the sense that there would be some story that shows that we have to end up talking the way we do, or maybe the way that, you know, people will do one, two, three, or N generations from now. The author that Rorty pushes forward at this point in the chapter as being an author who will be particularly useful to the kind of story that he wants to tell is Donald Davidson. And Davidson is introduced as somebody who breaks with the notion of language as a medium. Now, when Rorty talks about language as a medium, he is not thinking about like a specific philosophical theory that we could, you know, sort of identify with the thought of a particular philosopher. He's thinking of a very broad set of ways of thinking about language. And what all those ways of thinking about language have in common is that they, well, really have three important terms. There's on the one hand, me, the subject. There is on the other hand, the world of objects. And then in between them, in some sense, we find language. And so language is that which the subject uses to express their views about the object or to represent the structure of the object or something like that. Right? So there's subject, object and language somehow mediates between the subject and the object. And Rorty tells us that, you know, putting language in that position was, was in some ways at least an attempt to break out of earlier pictures where between the subject and the object there might be something like our ideas or our mental contents or something like that. And Rorty says, well, people started to say, no, no, it's, it's language that is this mediating thing, um, partly in order to maybe break out of this, this idea of a medium, to sort of break out of this idea that, um, that what we're trying to do um, or, or the way that we have to think about our relation 
to the world is, is this sort of mediated relation where subject and object have this gap between them and something that has to fill the void. And now it becomes very unclear how that void could be filled, how subject and object get together. In other words, this very familiar Cartesian picture of subject and object. And the way that talking about language instead of something like Cartesian ideas, the way that talking about language was supposed to help was that languages seem to be things that have a causal history, right? I mean, we can think about how we generate languages, how we come up with languages, how languages change through history, through interaction with physical objects. And so Rorty presents it here as a kind of naturalizing move. But he says, if that's what we're doing, if that's the only thing we're doing, then it's definitely not enough because we remain captured in this basic picture of a subject and an object and a mediating thing between them, which leads to all kinds of questions. Like, do we have the right language to describe the objects? Do we have the right language for expressing our, our, um, uh, for expressing our beliefs about the objects maybe? Um, does this language, this medium distort our view of the objects or does it show them the way that they themselves are? Right? Those are the kinds of questions that inevitably come up if we accept the kind of mediating picture uh, that Rorty is eager to replace. And so he says what we need to do is we don't just need to bring in language as something that is maybe more naturalistic than ideas, but we also need to tell a different story about language, a story under which language is not a medium. It is not something that we have uh, in order to represent the world and about which we can then ask these difficult questions like, does it represent the world? Does it falsify the world? And so on and so forth. And so again, the um, philosopher that he brings forward to, to help him make this point is Donald Davidson. And Davidson is supposed to help us think through the idea that language is a tool Okay, this is something that Rorty says he gets from Wittgenstein, the idea that language is a tool. And when we think of Wittgenstein in this connection, we are, we are not thinking of the early Wittgenstein of the Tractatus. Uh, we are thinking of the, um, of the Wittgenstein of the philosophical investigations when he talks about language games. Right, so, so here's this, this very famous example of Wittgenstein um, is where you have, have like these two builders, right? One person is sort of building something and he needs certain you know, blocks of specific sizes and shapes. And there's somebody else who helps him, who carries the blocks to him. And so they develop a language, which maybe has words like slab and block and pillar and who knows what. And that language works. I mean, that language is, is correct. It, it, it sort of, it, it fulfills everything that it has to fulfill in order to be a perfectly suitable language, just in case these two people can use it with you know, the effect that they want to achieve, which is that the guy who brings the blocks always brings the block that the guy who wants the blocks uh, needs, right? If, if, if that what the, that's what the language does, if, if one guy saying slab, you know, always leads him to get the block that he wants, then they have a good language. And so here we are thinking of language as a tool, which is to be used in a very specific situation. And different situations might ask for different tools, um, but it's always the tool aspect of language, not the representational aspect of language that is center stage. Okay, so it's the tool aspect of language, not the representational aspect of language that is center stage. Now, Rorty is well aware that to claim that language is a tool or that it is a, a series or, or, or set of tools is not totally unproblematic. And so at the bottom of page number 12, he says this, this Wittgensteinian analogy between vocabularies and tools has one obvious drawback. The craftsman typically knows what job he needs to do before picking or inventing tools with which to do it. By contrast, somebody like Galileo, Yeats or Hegel is typically unable to make clear exactly what it is that he wants to do before developing the language in which he succeeds in doing it. His new vocabulary makes possible for the first time 
a formulation of its own purpose. So when it comes to language, Rorty says, on the one hand, it is totally correct to think of language as a tool. I mean, you're using it to do something with that you want to that you want to do. And that is, in a sense, the way that you're going to evaluate it, right? A vocabulary is a successful vocabulary if it helps you achieve your goal, if it is the right tool for the job. But the radical difference between language and tools is that language is also what we use to come up with goals, right? When we describe goals to each other, when we explain our goals to each other, or even to ourselves, we are using language. And very often when it comes to revolutionary new ideas, well, what happens is that the goal itself and the language to describe the goal and the language that is the tool to get at the goal are sort of developed simultaneously and maybe are in fact even the same language, right? There is a sense in which I guess for many of the great philosophers, for instance, it is true that they develop a language, a way of thinking, a way of talking in order to achieve certain goals, but you can really only understand what the goal is once you have the entire language, right? There's not really a difference between, um, let's say, Kant's defense of transcendental idealism in the Critique of Pure Reason and Kant's explanation what transcendental idealism is in the Critique of Pure Reason, right? I mean, those two things really seem to be two sides of the same coin. So that is a distinction that will be very important for us to keep in mind, right? I mean, yes, there is something like evidently pragmatist here, something tool related here, but we should be well aware of the limitations that um, this notion of a tool is subject to. Now, the notion of a tool, of language as a tool, is already a pretty powerful step in an attempt to get out of the idea that language is a medium uh, used for representing reality about which the traditional philosophical questions could then be asked. Because like things like a hammer and a saw, while they clearly have some relation to reality, right? We have hammers and saws because they allow us to do certain things in the world that we want done. Um, nevertheless, it doesn't really make sense to ask questions like, well, is reality really hammer shaped? Or does the saw distort reality or not when we use it? So there is a sense in which like bringing in the notion of a tool is going to do a lot of work for Rotti, right? It sort of uh, gives us an alternative way of thinking about language, an alternative from the traditional way of thinking about language as a medium that represents reality, a medium in which we represent reality. Rotti wants to go a step further, and he does so starting from page 13 using a particular article of Davidson's, um, in which Davidson, according to Rotti, tells us that, you know, there, there is no, no entity called language or the language or our language. So this entire sort of traditional set of philosophical questions about our language and what it does it becomes a lot less plausible. It becomes a lot easier to set it aside once we see what language actually is, how it actually functions, which is in a much less, mono, uh, much less monolithic way, uh, in a much more like pluralistic, um, context-dependent, changing way than anything that traditional philosophers might have been thinking about. And so Rorty talks about an article of Davidson called A Nice Derangement of Epitaphs, which if you do not have the right background knowledge is definitely one of the least enlightening titles of a philosophical article ever. So what on earth is A Nice Derangement of Epitaphs? Well, it's a line that comes from a play, and I've written the details down here. It's a 1775 play called The Rivals by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Now, in this play, The Rivals, there is somebody called Mrs. Malaprop. Mrs. Malaprop. And Mrs. Malaprop is known for her malapropisms. Um, that is, for using the wrong word. Right? So she tries to say things using complicated words, 
but she, you know, generally uses the wrong word. This, by the way, is a is a is a, a comedy technique that was already well known to Shakespeare um, several hundred years earlier. But here in in this Sheridan play, it uh, it plays an important role. And one of the things that Mrs. Malaprop says at some point is she talks about a nice derangement of epitaphs, um, presumably meaning something like a nice arrangement of epithets, which would be something like an accurate sequence of the right words. And of course, it's kind of funny that in trying to say that you like an accurate sequence of the right words, you're actually making a totally deranged sequence of the wrong words. Um, so that's where, where Davidson's title comes from. And in the article, what Davidson is doing is he is pointing out that, well, he is using the example of the malapropism, right, the, the wrong word, and the fact that we generally are very, very able to understand that word, and what's more, to immediately compensate for this in our further understanding of the speaker. I mean, the next time that Mrs. Malaprop is going to use the word epitaph, epitaph, we think, oh, she probably means epithet, right? And the next time, you know, this happens all the time, according to Davidson. When I'm talking to someone, um, and it's not just about mistakes, it's about all aspects of language use. I am constantly thinking about, okay, what would this person, how would this person talk? What would this person know? What are the right things for me to say? What are the things that, that when they say it, how should I understand them? And we are continually changing these ideas based on how the conversation actually goes, right? So the kind of words that are used, the claims that are made, the mistakes that are made and so on and so forth all of that sort of i am continually updating my theory about how to interpret the other person's words and how to use my own words in such a way that there is a maximum probability of me being interpreted in the way that i want to be interpreted and so this constantly updated theory is what davidson calls a passing theory it's called a passing theory because it's well, it's passing, I guess, you know, you, you, it, it sort of changes in a moment and it's also only relevant for this moment, right? It, it's, it's not something that has any sort of longevity because first of all, I, I can't use it with the next speaker, but also I can't necessarily use it with this speaker even five or 10 minutes or, or from now or the next time that I see them because circumstances will have changed, things will have been said and so on and so forth. So. Okay, so there's this idea of this passing theory, and then Davidson wonders, well, you know, what, what really is the thing that we call language, right? And one way, I mean, Davidson's argument has a more complicated shape, but one way to understand what he's doing is that he is saying, look, language is, you know, it's supposed to be this set of rules that allows us to understand each other. But the actual set of rules that allows us to understand each other is our passing theory, which is something that is in the moment here right now between these two speakers always changing not generalizable to to other speakers uh, or other situations and so on and so forth so if anything's language this is not precisely the way that davidson says it but we we can imagine him or rotty saying something like this if there's anything that is language it's 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 this right but it's not at all there's no such thing as the language or even our language it's just this constantly changing series of theories that help us navigate this interpersonal space of communication. All right, so something like that is Davidson's story. Now, the way that Rorty presents Davidson's story here in, in chapter one of Contingency, Irony and Solidarity is pretty strange because Rorty presents it within some paragraphs that argue that the point of language is that we try to predict what the other will do, that we are trying not to be taken by surprise, Rorty writes in the middle of page 14. Um, and that is strange for two reasons. It is strange for, you know, I would say the basic reason that that really doesn't seem to be what communication is about, right? Not being taken, trying to not be taken by surprise why am I, I mean, if I can predict the other people, then I don't need to talk to them, right? I mean, aren't we talking precisely because we want to be predicted, uh, uh, surprised, because we want to be surprised? Well, maybe not always, 
right? When I say one bread, please, to the baker, then I'm, I probably don't want to be surprised. Um, but that doesn't seem to be very true for communication in general. So that's one thing that kind of makes it strange. But what makes it really strange is that Davidson is precisely talking, is precisely building up his theory um, around those situations in which we are surprised, in which somebody says a nice derangement of epitaphs. And it only makes sense if we think that, oh, they must be meaning a nice arrangement of epithets. I mean, that's pretty surprising, right? It's, it's precisely because we continually surprise each other that we need to continually build these passing theories that change all the time. So there seems to be some tension between Rorty's use of Davidson's article here on the one hand and Rorty's specific um, specific story about language as something that we use to predict each other in order not to be surprised. Now, I wanted to say that because otherwise you might have a, a completely like wrong expectation about the, about the article of Davidson and it would be very surprising to you indeed. But, so I wanted to say that, but I think it's also the case that, that you know, this tension isn't really important for the story that, that Rorty is trying to tell. Because it's still true that what Davidson is doing uh, in this article, but also in other articles, is sort of building up a theory of language that doesn't resemble the traditional theory of, of language as a system of rules that we use to represent reality very much at all. And that is, of course, what Rorty wants. Right? And if he had wanted to be more systematic about this, then he would have, you know, he would have had to talk about many more aspects of language, I guess. Um, not just what Davidson is talking about here, but, but all kinds of other things that Davidson and other philosophers congenial to Rorty's project would be talking about. Um, the one thing that Rorty does want to work out is how change of language through time works. Right? So this is something that is going to get some attention in the final pages of the chapter. And we can understand why Rorty would want to focus on that, because, you know, Rorty is trying to give us a counter story to the traditional teleological narrative that tells us that our language adapts by finding new concepts in reality and coming to resemble those concepts more and more closely. So Rorty wants to say something about how language changes, wants to give us an alternative story to that. That alternative story um, is going to be a story about language as contingent, not teleological. And it is going to have to involve a different story about where new concepts come from, right? If we don't get new concepts by having a special new insight into reality, finding a new kind of thing, observing a new kind of process, uh, having a new kind of insight into our you know, internal constitution, if that's not the way that language change works, where do these new concepts come from? How does language change over time? And Rorty's answer to that is a story about metaphors. Okay, it's a story about metaphors. Um, I want to make one side remark about Roddy's claim that we have to see the development of language as contingent. It's very central to the story that he wants to tell. It is not immediately clear that we can accept it. And this is, I think, something that we will want to keep in mind and come back to when we get to the parts of the book about irony. What I mean by saying that it's not immediately clear that we can accept it is the following. So suppose that you are a scientist working nowadays and you have a particular vocabulary with which to describe certain phenomena. And you know that in history, other people have had other vocabularies with which to describe those same phenomena. Or, you know, I, I'm going to assume that they're the same phenomena, that that is a phrase that makes some sense. Now, do you believe that your vocabulary is the best? Well, you are using your vocabulary and not those other historical vocabularies. So it would seem to imply that you think that you do have the best vocabulary 
Because otherwise, you know, it would be this totally open question which vocabulary to use, and it would seem to be no particular reason to, you know, when you go to work on Monday, to continue using the vocabulary that you used last week instead of uh, doing some work in Aristotle's vocabulary this week or uh, in Augustine's vocabulary or who knows, uh, who knows, uh, um, has been talking about this in the past too. So there seems to be something in human sort of in our use of concepts or even in our you know our basic acceptance and use of, of theories and ideas some necessity to think of of them as sort of the best point the best thing that we have and that would seem to imply a certain kind of teleological story okay that's just a, a vague thought maybe at this moment but i do think it is something that we have to keep in mind that we have to ask ourselves the question whether Rorty can really get rid of the idea of a teleological direction as part of our self-interpretation as cognitive subjects. And when Rorty comes to the notion of irony, that is going to be one of the main burdens of his story, right? He's going to have to tell us that, yes, you can, right? Yes, you can say that, you know, in some deep sense, we can't say that our way of thinking is better than any other way of thinking. Still, we can accept it as our way of thinking, right? That's that's part of the story of irony. Okay, so that's just looking forward to that. So what we have here in the final pages is a sort of history of the development of language as a history of metaphor. Um, so the basic idea that Rorty takes from people like Nietzsche, uh, he also mentions here uh, Donald Davidson again, and Mary Hasse, or Hess, I don't, actually know how to pronounce her name, um, who basically sort of suggest that what happens in language is that we introduce metaphors to talk about things, and then slowly but certainly those metaphors become more and more literal, right? And so Nietzsche at some point says that language um, is just sort of this, this field of dead metaphors, right? We don't, we no longer realize that all these ways of, of speaking, all these ways of thinking that we have were once metaphorical, but they have become literal. Uh, and so Rorty glosses that as talking about the distinction between familiar and unfamiliar uses of noises and marks. This is the bottom of page 17, where a metaphor is something that is unfamiliar. Right? And when it becomes familiar, then, you know, it has become literal. And that's how new concepts get into the language. We have strange ways of speaking, and that's how new concepts get into the language, because those strange ways become common, well-known, worn-out ways of speaking. Uh, Mary Hesse, in her, um, in her philosophy of science, for instance, says that something like, like if I say that, that a gas is a collection of balls flying through space, that is a metaphor. Right? And that is the way that scientific theorizing works. And of course, we sort of at some point may start forgetting that it's a metaphor. And we think of gas as, as being in some sense literally a collection of balls. Hmm. Okay, so what is important for Rotti is that metaphors do something. They change the way we talk, they change the way we think, they change the kind of conclusions that we draw, they change the way that language functions as a tool uh, if we accept new metaphors, we, we generate new tools, but they're not true or false, right? We can't really say that it's, it's or, or we shouldn't really ask whether it is true or false that a gas is balls flying through space. Um, what the metaphor is trying to do is it, it's trying to be useful in certain ways, which in, in the case of science might involve explanation or prediction. Um, and if it is successful, that's good. But it doesn't really make sense to wonder whether it's true or false, to wonder whether it, it, whether it adequately captures the real nature of reality or not. So Rorty is, is espousing some kind of anti-realism here and saying that, you know, we shouldn't even ask the question of truth or falsity when it comes to this kind of introduction of new language, of new theories. Um, and of course, that's precisely the kind of story of linguistic change that he wants to tell us. Like it doesn't have to do with more adequately representing some pre-existing structure in reality. It has to do with inventing new ways of speaking that allow us to do new things. Okay, that's the kind of story that Rorty wants us to, uh, to have. 
This is true for how we, how we talk about the external world, but for Rorty, it's equally true for how we talk about the internal world, right, about ourselves. And so he says, um, this is on page 20, that to change how we talk is to change what, for our own purposes, we are. Right? When we generate new self-descriptions, we also generate who we are. And so for the self, maybe even more clearly than for the world outside of us, um, the idea of finding an adequate expression doesn't seem to make sense because it's the expressions that make us who we are. There is no pre-given self that will remain constant under redescriptions. It's the redescriptions that change and constitute the self. Okay, let me end this lecture and our discussion of chapter one by reading you some of the last lines of the chapter. Um, the line of thought common to Blumenberg, Nietzsche, Freud and Davidson suggests that we try to get to the point where we no longer worship anything, where we treat nothing as a quasi divinity, where we treat everything, our language, our conscience, our community as a product of time and chance. To reach this point would be, in Freud's words, to treat chance as worthy of determining our fate. Right, so what Rorty wants us to do is, he wants us to see ourselves really fundamentally as the end point, maybe I shouldn't use the word fundamentally, or really. What he wants us to do, he wants us to see ourselves as the end point of a contingent historical process that has made us who we are now, the future wide open for new self-descriptions, rather than seeing ourselves as on the move towards better approaching some pre-existing ideal in ourselves, in the world, in God, something that we treat as a quasi-divinity that we worship, and thus to treat chance as worthy of determining our fate. Having seen how that works for language, Rorty is going to tackle conscience, like the way that we think of ourselves and morality, and our community and political projects in the next two chapters.